The Quarterly, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Lesson 11, 2nd Corinthians 4, 7 to 5, 21. Present Suffering, Future Glory. Paul has been defending his gospel to the Corinthians in the face of accusations that, unlike the super apostles, 2 Corinthians 11.5, his gospel is one of weakness and suffering. Far from backing down, Paul doubles down on the acknowledgement of the reality of present suffering. Paul and his fellow apostles are stewards of a great treasure, but they carry it around in jars of clay that must be broken if that treasure is to come to the world. Chapter 4, verse 4. In this way, the power is seen to be God's, and God gets all the glory. While at the same time, the apostles put on display the sufferings of Christ through their own sufferings. Chapter 4, verse 11. Paul is not ashamed of these sufferings, which he calls light and momentary, because they bring with them the sure hope of a weighty and enduring eternal glory. Chapter 4, verse 17. The prospect of this future glory is like exchanging a temporary earthly tent for an eternal, durable dwelling place. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1 A hope that gives us great boldness in the midst of our present difficulties. God is the one who has prepared our inheritance for us. The same God before whom we must all one day stand, when we present ourselves before the judgment seat of Christ. Chapter 5 verse 10 Yet we need not fear that judgment day, since our judge will be the same person who is himself our reconciliation. Chapter 5, verse 18. In him we are new creation. Verse 17. Already possessing by faith the future glory and inheritance that will be ours on the last day. In the person of Paul, the messenger and the message have merged into one. God's light has shone into his heart, giving him knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. But that inestimable treasure is held in fragile clay jars, verse 7, which have no power of their own to protect the gospel treasure, and no glory of their own to add to it. This recalls the alabaster jar of perfume with which the unnamed woman anointed Jesus, in Mark 14.3, the jar had to be broken for its costly contents to be delivered. In this case, however, the container was cheap and unremarkable, not heirloom quality alabaster. If this weakness and brokenness was the experience of the apostle, how much more must it be true of the ordinary Christian? Paul enumerates some of the sufferings he has endured anticipating the full listing in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 4 through 10. But in each case, he matches an experience of suffering with a parallel source of hope, in chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Suffering never has the last word in the life of a Christian, but is rather the means by which good news comes to those who have not yet heard it. Paul was carrying around with him the death of Jesus, not merely so that he might ultimately experience life in the new creation, but so the, the Corinthians might experience life as well. Chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. In Psalm 11610, quoted in 2 Corinthians 4.13, the psalmist proclaimed his confidence in God in the midst of suffering, and so he continued to speak. Likewise, the result of Paul's confidence in his identity in Christ was great perseverance in the face of all obstacles, 2 Corinthians 4.16. His outer self, his body and his worldly attainments, might be fading away, but that was only so that they might be replaced by an inward person who was continually being made new in Christ, chapter 5, verse 17. Paul's contrast is not so much between the visible earthly world and the invisible heavenly world, as it is between the present world, what we see now, and the promised heavenly future, what we shall see. Our present sufferings are light and momentary, 
in comparison to the surpassing greatness of the glory that awaits us at the resurrection. Chapter 4, verse 17. Paul further unpacks this contrast between the challenges of the present and the glories of the future in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 10. Paul moves from the contrasting the outer and inner person to comparing the present and future dwelling. Our present dwelling is a temporary tent, like the ones Israel inhabited during their wilderness wanderings. But our future inheritance is a permanent eternal dwelling, like the land God promised to give Israel. Chapter 5, verse 1. Wilderness camping is no fun when pursued out of necessity rather than as a hobby. It's characterized by impermanence and the absence of amenities, and it's a burden. Verse 4. On the other hand, the house that has been prepared for us is God's gift, not something manufactured by human hands, and it's lasting. Chapter 5, verse 1. By that standard, even Solomon's temple in all its glory was inadequate because it was temporary and built by human beings. Our temple is Christ, our eternal hope and home. See John 2, verses 18 to 22. Adopting the language he used in 1 Corinthians 15, 53, Paul speaks of the mortal body being clothed in immortality. 2 Corinthians 5, 2. However, since the resurrection body will not be received until the consummation of the new creation, those who die in the meantime are temporarily left in an intermediate state. Chapter 5, verse 8. This is not the same as being found naked. Chapter 5, verse 4. That would be to have no imperishable clothes at all. However, with the rest of creation, we long for the completion of God's work of recreation. Chapter 5, verse 8. Compare Romans 8, 23. Paul's exploration of these seemingly abstract theological ideas has a very practical purpose, to encourage the Corinthians uh, to be of good courage. 2 Corinthians 4.16, 5.8 Paul would not have understood the concept of a person being so heavenly minded that they're no earthly use. On the contrary, it was Paul's sure hope of his heavenly reward that made him bold in the face of great suffering and persecution. The idea of having to appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive our reward for what we have done in our earthly bodies, 2 Corinthians 5.10, might seem like works righteousness, until the context is considered. The verses that follow make it clear that though the judgment of our actions would surely lead to our condemnation, we may rest secure because we have been reconciled with God through the blood of Christ. Chapter 5, verse 21. So we need not fear that judgment day. It must inevitably result in our vindication, because we are clothed in Christ's righteousness. The knowledge of the coming day of judgment instills in Paul a proper fear of the Lord. Not the slavish fear of a tyrant, but the reverence of a heavenly father. Paul is not afraid for his own future but he's deeply concerned about the fate of those who do not know Christ, who have nothing to anticipate on that last day other than fearful dread. The knowledge of that coming judgment motivates Paul to redouble his efforts, to bring the gospel to people who have not yet heard it, 2 Corinthians 5.11. He's driven by the love of Christ to preach the gospel to all kinds of people, so that they too might be united to Christ in his death and resurrection, and in consequence, that they might henceforth live for him. Chapter 5, verse 15. This is a life of joyful gratitude in the present, as well as ongoing participation in Christ. And ultimately, it means nothing less than resurrection and eternal life with Christ, who is our hope of glory. Previously, Paul had judged people according to the flesh, 2 Corinthians 5.16. That is, he considered some people, observant Jews, insiders to God's favor, while others, everyone else, were outsiders. Now, however, those old categories have been transformed. There is only in Christ and not yet in Christ. 
The former category, whether Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free, consists of those who are already part of this new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 This is not because of anything in themselves. It's the gift of God, who through Christ has reconciled us to himself. Chapter 5, verse 18 But there are still many who are not yet in Christ. And it's this group that Paul is eager to persuade of the truth of the gospel. In this mission from God, Paul has been commissioned as God's ambassador, speaking on behalf of Christ, appealing to all people to be reconciled with God, so that their sins might not be counted against them. Chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. The gospel of reconciliation is, at its heart, an act of substitution, that God made Christ, who had never sinned, to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Chapter 5, verse 21. This is not an image of Christ wrestling sinners to safety from the hands of an angry God, but the Father, at enormous personal cost, subjecting his beloved Son to the punishment that each of our sins deserve, so that we, who are guilty sinners and alienated from God, might finally become God's friends. Application Questions 1. Why does God give us the treasure of the gospel in clay jars? What does that mean? 2. How have you seen God's grace be sufficient for you in your weakness? See 2 Corinthians 12.9. 3. How does the reality of present suffering and future glory change your perspective on death? 4. How does the reality of present suffering and future glory change your attitude to other people?